Hello. Welcome back after the coffee break, and thank you for, uh, for being here. Um, and welcome to this uh, plenary session on uh, policy tools and instruments, which, as you know, will um, uh, address issues related with uh, the support to innovation. And um, I will have to be uh, brief in my introduction, so I will pass on directly to uh, the next speaker, which I will also briefly introduce, and uh, we will try to gain some time uh, to, uh, so that we can all go for lunch without getting too tired. So the first speaker in our program is Laura Busatu. Laura uh, works at the European Investment Bank and in the Innovation Finance Advisory. And uh, Laura has uh, quite a vast experience, 16 years in investment banking, capital markets, and industry in uh, mining and energy, and uh, is an engineer from the University uh, Politecnica de Valencia with a specialization in nuclear energy and uh, will deliver us the view from the European Investment Banks on the policy tools and instrument, instruments of support to innovation in infrastructures. So thank you very much, Laura. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. Good morning still to everybody. Thank you very much for inviting the AIB. Uh, I think it's the second time <coughs> that we are here with you. Uh, sorry, it doesn't. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting us. The AIB, I believe, is the second time out of two that we are here. We are very pleased, and I'm very pleased to be uh, to be part of this of this panel. Relatively recently, our one of our vice presidents stated that science requires patience. And I would like to enrich a little bit that sentence by saying that science requires overcoming a universe of foreseeable and unforeseeable challenges with patience. And be it that access to finance is one of them. And this is the reason why, why we are here today. Therefore, I would like to, to spend a couple of minutes introducing uh, the EIB, what we, can we do for research and uh, research infrastructure, uh, and what we are doing for research infrastructure. I will also uh, like to set up the scene by going back and reviewing the main financing challenges that the research infrastructure has. And I will, of course, uh, want to touch base uh, very quickly, and you will understand why very quickly, when it's the center of the, uh, of the topic of the, of the panel, in the um, financial instruments that, that the EIB has uh, in the context of research infrastructure. And uh, I would like also to mention briefly what in the Innovation Finance Advisory part of the EIB we can do for, uh, for research infrastructure. So, the EIB, the EIB um, has a AAA rating. Uh, in addition, we have a very valuable and unparalleled human capital in uh, the form of technical experts that are able to assess and evaluate technologies, uh, very important for accessing, uh, uh, assessing the bankability of a project. Uh, this will not, is, is rare to find elsewhere. Third, we have our partnerships with the European Commission in the form of financial instruments. One of them, the InnoFIN program, uh, which uh, puts a, an eye on, on research infrastructure. Also, uh, the EIB has a catalyzing effect. Uh, it, uh, has the, it sends a signaling effect when it invests in, in, in projects, which means that um, it brings the attention and hopefully the investment of the, private, of the private sector. And these are the reasons why the EIB is in a unique position to, to help and support the, the, the investment in, in research infrastructure. This is taking a little bit of time to move on. Um, now, because, because, and let me touch base in what we do within the AIB Innovation Finance Advisory. 
because research infrastructure has uh, very unique challenges in access to finance, they're very complex and very diverse in nature. Um, the innovation finance advisory uh, activity within the EIB is even more important for this for this uh, for this sector, if I can, if you allow me to call it that way. Um, why? Because we do two things that are very relevant. One of them is that we provide project advisory. Um, there are a substantial amount of sound research, development, and innovation projects which fail to access bank finance because they are not sufficiently well prepared uh, from a financial, from an investor perspective. Before it was mentioned the fact that um, that there was a gap between, let me see if I repeat it properly, between science and market, but the truth is that there is also a big gap between science and investors. Uh, the project advisory can help to, 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 to close or aim to close that, that gap and uh, improve the bankability of projects. We are working, we have uh, provided advisory to the ESS infrastructure. We, have, uh, we are currently providing advisory to research and technology organizations, uh, including research infrastructure projects. And the other leg, the very important leg for, for, the, for the purpose here is our horizontal activities, which aim to uh, identify finding gaps in across sectors of thematic areas. And uh, when those uh, gaps are identified, provide solutions uh, aimed to close that gap. This may mean in the form of developing new financial instruments or improving existing ones. Now, this is particularly important because in fact, we have then completed uh, two uh, studies in this, in this sense. One is uh, the financing of uh, pan-European research infrastructures, and the second is uh, access to finance of research and technology organizations and their industrial partners. This, oops, uh, um, this study in fact was completed in, in, uh, in March this year. Um, I invite all of you to, to look at it, it's, it's publicly available at the EIB webpage. And this study that was co-authored by myself and by my colleague Arnold Berlbeck, what among many other things, it identifies the challenges, uh, the business and financial challenges that these uh, research and technology organizations face for their own nature. They tend to be, they tend to be ahead of the markets uh, because of the nature of the technologies, and this is a common ground here. Um, it also identifies the need of getting science closer to not only to, to the market, of course, but also in the end to finance, so to the conversion of the language from science to, 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 to finance in order to attract the, the private investor base. It also um, identifies the need of improve the financial flexibility of, uh, of, uh, of these of projects, of uh, research and, and, and infrastructure, sorry, research and development projects, including research infrastructure, uh, by combining uh, grants uh, with uh, return-based finance to the extent that's possible. Now, this is easy said, more difficult done, and this is why innovation finance advisory um, is a key instrument to, 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 to make this blending or to structure the projects in a way that have an opportunity or a possibility of um, accessing return-based finance in addition to, to grants. Um, as I said, I would like to also uh, not forget, or, uh, you know, I believe that this has been discussed in the past, in these and other forums, but can never be forgotten the, 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 funding, the, the funding challenges that, that, uh, that the research uh, infrastructure projects face. And of course, one size does not fit, fit all. There are multiple types of uh, research infrastructure projects with different um, uh, different, uh, different underlying objectives, different uh, underlying technologies and, uh, and complexities. However, there is um, certain common, common, common pillars with different, uh, with different weight in, in each of the cases. One of them is the very intensive nature of the CAPEX and, and of the OPEX, which tends to be for a very long periods of time. The second one is the fact that the, and it was this, of course discussed before, the fact that the commercialization prospects tend to be very limited. Not to say that potentially these commercialization prospects, as it was discussed here, can be, poten can be somehow, to some extent, maybe improved. But the reality is that as it currently stands, the com commercialization prospects tend to be quite uh, limited. 
which means that the shareholders or the stakeholders have to uh, make the contributions to ensure the whole life cycle of the project. And this is not the only reason. So this means from inf inception to phase out. If you take into consideration that also the by the nature, these projects have a long term na nature, this implies a substantial commitment, difficult to achieve. And the, and the last one is that in this type of projects, and I will not get into financial language, which uh, because you possibly will start leaving for lunch before I finish, but there is a cash flow mismatch, which is very important and it's a very it's a big barrier in order to to to, to finance this project. The fact that uh, the cash outflows and the cash and the revenues, so the the, the, the financial ob the, the obligations, sorry, the cost, not only the financial obligations, but the cost of the projects and the sources of, of, of revenues are not matching in time, uh, which means that, uh, that this brings a big liquidity issue to this project that needs to be addressed and that you will not find necessarily in other types of projects. In addition, in addition uh, to that, you have, depending on what project you are looking at, of course, you have, and it was also mentioned before, you have the value, you have the value, the, the, the clear or the pure value of death, which is the transfer, the, it's transferring when you are transferring from a pilot to commercialization phase. There's that, that that phase of the development uh, in, in, in uh, research and development. That phase of the development means that you have a very, very uh, capital intensive phase of a project where the and it's also the time of the project where you are going to have to put it very simple the yes and no whether this is going to go ahead or not in terms of commercialization. So this is the 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 point where investors do not do not uh, are not willing to, to to come in and where the capital investment is more is more needed and is more intensive so these are some of the challenges and we cannot forget about them and the, and i would like now to quickly move into the eib financial instruments in particular to the innovin program um, because this program is particularly is is, uh, is, is particularly uh, relevant, of course, for for research and uh, for research uh, and, uh, and innovation. Now, the the good news is that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, and because in fact the the program is currently being redesigned. It is supposed to be completed and uh, and uh, and up and running. Uh, in June, but the good thing about the redesigning of, of, of this project is that it has a much higher, uh, ever, uh, ever much higher focus on uh, research infrastructure uh, and uh, research and technology organizations, universities, uh, and, um, and uh, institutions, other institutions of a kind. It also, um, in terms of the value of death, which we have this thematic finance here covering energy and infectious diseases. Uh, this thematic finance, in fact, in the case of energy demonstration pro uh, projects is aimed to, to, to address the value of death, which is between pilot and demonstration, so TRL 7, 8. And in fact, um, if, uh, if things are as being discussed, and I, of course I cannot, I cannot disclose, but this, um, the new Innofin program is going to have a higher weight on, 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 this, uh, on these facilities, uh, aiming to, to, to close the, the, the research and innovation um, gaps. Having said that, Maybe um, just a very quick of what we do in Innovation Finance Advisory and what, how we can help. Now, our projects, our, our advisory may last from three months to two years, okay? There is no time limitation. For research infrastructure, such as that, that, that one that we provided advisory for um, ESS, uh, then it was, a, it was an advisory that lasted two years. Uh, in order to transform this project to, to something bankable. Uh, it was quite successful because in the end uh, the EIB provided 100 million euros and, the, and the, the good news about this project and what I like most, most of it, of course the technology and, uh, and the, the science component in, in it, but it's also the fact that it's the first time, I mean, an ERIC project has uh, external financing, not only the 100 million from the EIB, but also the 
the other 200 million, I think I have lost my pointer, okay. The 200 million from, uh, that you see there for the total of 300 million is external uh, return-based finance. So we are doing things for research infrastructure. There are long-term advisory periods. Um, the sooner that we have the project in-house, the better, because it allows us to work with the project promoter in providing or in steering the project in a way that is going to have some chances of being bankable rather than to get a complete project that cannot be changed. And uh, lastly, um, also in general, we are very well positioned as the EIB because we can provide long-term finance for research infrastructure. This means finance of 15, 20 years, uh, depending of course on the project, which means that uh, it is reflects very much the, the nature, the long, li the long uh, life nature of the project and of the, and of the potential payments. So having said that, I close my session. I would like to invite, even after the questions, I would like to invite uh, people to come and talk to me and uh, see how we can uh, can help um, or even exchange ideas. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, we will collect all the questions. Please remember them uh, and uh, do them at the end. So I will um, right away call the next speaker. And uh, it's Philippe Troissart which you, you all know by now, but uh, <laughs> Deputy Head of Unit of uh, Research Infrastructures of the DG Research and Innovation at the European Commission, vast experience in, in, in different other units uh, in the European Commission, and um, one of the persons that knows more about research infrastructure than I know about. Can I use that? Okay. Good, uh, good morning again, or maybe, maybe not. We yeah, are good afternoon. Actually, I, I still am um, Brussels time, so for me it's really good afternoon. Um, what I'm going to do in this presentation is to go through a little bit the immediate future as regard the activities that we have on innovation in the framework program Horizon 2020. I will actually start where Octavi stopped. Uh, that was done on purpose, incidentally. So there is no m magic there. Um, reminding you of what we have in the specific program. I need to read it as well, please, otherwise. Can I change that? Okay. We have four actions on the, the innovation potential of research infrastructures uh, in the specific program. And I think it's important to go back to them uh, because this is our legal base and anything which is outside these objectives, we cannot cover. As simple as that. So within Horizon 2020, we will only be able to develop activities and initiatives on innovation providing that they fit within the remit of these four bullets. The first one concerns the partnership with industry to develop uh, scientific instrumentations with research infrastructures. The second one is on the pre-commercial procurement. Octavie mentioned the example of uh, Quaco that we had uh, supported in the past for uh, the, the procurement of uh, uh, magnets with CERN. And uh, this is a very good example, but this is the only example that we have actually for PCP. And uh, the reason why we have only one project for PCP is that we, when we launched the first call for PCP, we basically received one good proposal and that was it. So there was very little uptake and that made us think a little bit of the usefulness of this instrument for research infrastructures and their cooperation with the industrial suppliers. Now the feedback that we get from Quaco is, as Octavie said, they're getting very positive. So we do not exclude in the future to open again such uh, an initiative, such a call for PCPs and research infrastructures. The third line of action concerns the use of research infrastructures by industry, and there were quite many examples this morning that were given to you from uh, experience of projects that are developing precisely this uh, these initiatives to uh, facilitate uh, the access and the use of their research infrastructures by industry. And the last one concerns the integration of research infrastructures into the local, regional, national ecosystem. Uh, this is something that we are doing not directly, but we are doing through the mainstreaming of 
uh, our activities. So what we have been doing so far is uh, addressing innovation within quite many parts of our program and for instance through the integrating activities that are well known to you but also through specific activities like for instance as I mentioned already the PCPs I mentioned the technical, technological infrastructures and uh, the measures for co-innovation. In the integrating activities it's quite present but it's not necessarily very much used and that was one of the findings that we made last year when we were confronting what we call the super advanced communities for integrating activities with uh, this aspect of innovation and asking them why is it that there is so little uptake in your project on the innovation aspects. And, and I think mainly it's because of lack of uh, awareness and information from the proposers themselves that they can do these activities within the remit of their projects. Uh, it was very, very strange, for instance, to see that they were not aware that they could cover the, the additional transaction cost for the participation of industry to access their research infrastructures. This is a completely eligible cost that they could cover through the grants, but they were not using it. There were also this issue, and that was raised this morning, that uh, for SME there is an exemption as regards the, 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 the need to publish their results. Again, this is something that was not necessarily widely known. And, and that means that from the start in our activities, there were provisions to facilitate the use of the research infrastructures by industry, but it was not necessarily widely known. So what we want to do is really to raise this awareness further for the next, pro for the next program and to provide some additional functionalities. So in the work program 2018 and 2020, we have six calls, which are very much linked to the uh, strategic orientation that were identified uh, for us by our expert advisory group. And more particularly, the one which is of concern to us today is the one demonstrating the role of research infrastructures in the translation of open science into open innovation, where we would like to have their dedicated activities to foster the innovation potential of research infrastructures. So I will go through these slides. There is a big draft that you can see. Uh, we have presented these slides already to our program committee some time ago. Uh, we have circulated the draft of the work program 1820 to our program committee recently, and we are going to have an extensive, I suppose extensive, but fruitful discussion with them on Friday. Uh, so if ever you have uh, comments or suggestions to make to your delegate uh, following this uh, presentation, uh, feel free to do so. You have only two days or three days to do that. Uh, because uh, we will uh, go through the different sections of this work program at the end of the week with uh, the delegates of the member states. So in this call, we have uh, four or five actions. I think it's actually two. Yes, four actions, sorry. Uh, the first one is uh, an initiative that uh, is managed by uh, DigiConnect and uh, concerns the uh, innovation potential of SMEs that will be providing services or using services for the uh, European Open Science Cloud. I'll come back to that. The second one is a very targeted in initiative concerning the uh, networking of industrial liaison officers. And then we have two actions which are more sizable. One on uh, the uh, follow-up of uh, an ongoing initiative that we launched already in the previous work program, uh, which is the uh, co-innovation platform for research infrastructures. And the last one is uh, the innovation pilot that we would like to develop as a, a follow-up of the support that we could provide to the integrating activities that have reached uh, quite a high level of integration by now. Now concerning the SMEs and the activities that will be managed by uh, my colleagues from Connect, the idea really is to facilitate uh, to stimulate the innovation potential of these SMEs in the following domains, as users of services provided by the EOSC, by the EOSC and as users of advanced HPC services. This is very much linked to the other components of the support that we will provide to the EOSC via a dedicated call where on the Connect side there will be further integration of the uh, EOSC services and development of new uh, services provided uh, as part of the uh, of the EOSC. And this is this action there, which is under this innovation call, is focusing specifically on SME. 
Regarding the industrial liaison officers, the idea there is not to support the development of new liaison officers, but to take advantage of the experience that have been gained by the industrial liaison officers in uh, quite a number of research infrastructures and to develop uh, a networking uh, of these liaison officers so that they can share uh, their good practices, their experience, and they can organize a number of brokerage events and awareness campaigns towards, in particular, the industry and the SMEs. Uh, the idea would be to cover a wide range of scientific communities and not restrict to uh, a small subset of uh, research infrastructures. And uh, this is an action that we would like to launch as early as 2018. The last two actions that we have in uh, this uh, specific call for uh, innovation in the work program 1820 concerns uh, calls or topics that will actually only be released in 2020 so far. That's, that's our plan. So I cannot really develop to a large extent what will be covered because, I mean, this is the rule of the game as regards Horizon 2020 for the last work program, 1820. We provide a detailed description of the topics which will be open in 18 and 19, and we only provide uh, an outline of what will be covered by the work program 2020. So you'll have to bear with me. I'm not going to provide you with much uh, detail there. The uh, information concerning the first uh, topic is, as I said, uh, very much a follow-up of what we initiated uh, in the work program 1617, uh, and uh, where we would like to continue this, uh, this uh, co-development or co-creation principle between research infrastructure and industry in specific domains. As it was mentioned uh, in the previous work program, we had uh, focused our attention to detection and imaging technologies, and it's very likely that this, again, will be covered with, with this follow-up initiative. The last one for the innovation um, pilot, there the idea is uh, to look at the advanced communities for integrating activities and those that have already reached a high level of integration and that are willing to move forward and develop a coherent strategy for development of innovation within their, uh, their networks. So in a way, uh, we would target very specific communities of infrastructures that are willing to develop together new components, new instrumentation, to develop a strategy for new technologies that requires to be uh, some specific developments for the, the short to medium term. And that we, we will focus the, the action only on that. That means there will not be any support anymore on transnational access. It would be a project that would focus exclusively on, uh, if you want, uh, an extension of the joint research activities that were con contained and covered by the uh, uh, existing integrating activity scheme. This is an NCP meeting. I have to mention a little bit the process as well and uh, to let you know when we are going to uh, to, uh, to conclude with the uh, publication of the, the calls. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a PC meeting uh, on Friday. We, we discuss extensively the comments that we received from the various delegates on all parts of the program. We have another meeting on the 9th of June where we should be in a position to more or less finalize most of the components of the program. And the idea is to publish uh, the calls at the end of uh, September, beginning of October for the first calls and for deadlines which will uh, stack uh, the beginning of uh, next year and, and so on. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Philip. Very enlightening as always. <laughs> very enlightening as always. Um, so I will uh, pass on to the next speaker, uh, Roman. Hevesda, I don't know if I'm spelling it right, and I, am, I apologize for that. Roman uh, is a deputy director of the Institute of Physics at the Czech Republic, and uh, is responsible for preparing and commissioning of the Eli Beamlines research infrastructures. Uh, he has uh, extensive experience with uh, structural fund management, which as you know are at the heart of Eli, and, um, and also some uh, experience in cooperation between educational institutions and private sector knowledge transfer, etc. So let's hear what Roman brings us today. Thank you. 
Thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to, to be here and have a chance to uh, share with you the experience we learned uh, from the construction phase of uh, the ELI project. Um, uh, as you know, there are three pillars of, of ELI, uh, so I will try to summarize the experience for, for all of them, uh, maybe with particular focus to what I know the best, which is the ELI B minds pillar. Um, uh, ELI is also referred to a, a good practice in using various instruments, and since the panel is about uh, instruments uh, in fostering innovations uh, within uh, the research infrastructures, I will try to, to stick to that topic uh, in, in the same time to uh, introduce um, uh, what we are doing at ELI. Uh, so first of all, it, 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 what we believe is it really starts with the mission of the facility, and there I would uh, when we come back to the, to the keynote speaker uh, who addressed uh, the, the basic topics related to the uh, research infrastructures and they link to the innovations, which uh, um, uh, it's, it's definitely about uniqueness of the technology, that means all the capacity. It's about um, the establishment of, uh, of the access, that means to make it available and make the infrastructure available to the users. And it's also about training people. It seems to be obvious, but we really believe that uh, uh, the, the three aspects needs to go in parallel and have uh, uh, the same focus uh, in order to, to um, um, present the, the impact that uh, is foreseen. Uh, so that means it starts with the, with the science. It, it, it starts with, uh, with the scientific excellence. Um, but also, what brings the impact um, are the applications. Uh, and, and here we are coming to, to the history of, of ELI uh, that was listed on, on the S3 Open in 2006. And um, uh, then um, in 2010 or 2011, the projects uh, were uh, received funding from the structure funds, uh, which was at the time a uh, very first time for the very first time that uh, uh, research infrastructure construction phase uh, received um, a funding that was uh, up to that moment not very foreseen uh, primarily for this kind of activities. Uh, so in, in, in summary, uh, uh, Eli aims to, to establish the first uh, international uh, laser research facility or infrastructure that's fully dedicated for the users. Uh, it's uh, implemented in the new member states, uh, still after 13 years, uh, new member states, um, uh, which uh, has obviously very important role towards innovation and cohesion. Um, uh, it is a distributed infrastructure uh, which uh, may represent uh, certain challenges, also given the, the nature of ELI, which is a physical technological infrastructure, um, but also creates a lot of benefits, I will, I will try to, call, to talk about. And uh, it combines uh, uh, various instruments, various financial instruments mainly. Um, the preparatory phase was funded from the framework uh, program, as, as most of the preparatory phases of, of S3 uh, infrastructures. The construction phase uh, was funded uh, by uh, through three independent projects uh, funded uh, uh, from uh, the structure funds. And um, uh, the operational phase uh, shall be through, uh, hopefully very soon, established Eli Eric, funded by the member states. Uh, so this is where, where it starts, and to, to introduce the, the context, um, uh, in, let's say within, within Europe, uh, a very well established uh, laser community, um, a scientific community uh, that um, um, uh, uses uh, laser um, uh, facilities uh, for, for doing the research. Uh, um, national, facility, national laser facilities uh, that um, uh, were able to create a very well-functional network uh, enabling um, translational access to the users um, as, as two basic human resources and capacity 
um, um, preconditions for taking another step and uh, establishing a, a new challenge to uh, develop or construct and operate uh, for the first time a laser um, um, research infrastructure. Um, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the facilities were funded from the structure funds has introduced uh, quite significant modification in the approach uh, of, of looking at uh, uh, and monitoring uh, the impact of what needs to be done and, and, and uh, uh, aspects that are not purely scientific. Um, uh, that's why uh, the managing authorities and the European Commission uh, introduced for these uh, major projects a um, uh, set of criteria that were on the level of ex, ex ante um, stage um, assessed uh, through a cost-benefit analysis, introducing many measures uh, that uh, are being now monitored, tracked. I will try to show you what are the outcomes of, of this exercise, uh, uh, which was uh, at that point uh, quite new approach that was not fully digested at that moment, but we, are, we now see that uh, we have acquired many data that now helps us to understand uh, where we are with respect to the, to the missions I have introduced at the beginning. Obviously, from the methodolo methodological point of view, uh, they are uh, looking at the impacts related to um, uh, social economic uh, benefits or innovations in that sense, in, in specific terms. Uh, we can look at, at direct, indirect aspects, uh, uh, geographical impact, uh, the, the timing of, uh, of this. Um, uh, but I don't think it's uh, the purpose of uh, this session. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, here I would like to show on a couple of two, three last slides, uh, basically the outputs of that. It's not uh, to impress you with the figures. It's um, in fact not the most important, are uh, not the, the values itself. Uh, what uh, matters is that uh, it really proves uh, that we are able to track the path and uh, that some impacts and outcomes are, are, are visible from that. So uh, obviously, in the first place, a number of publications is, is a natural process, even though uh, we are in a construction phase, um, uh, or at the end of the construction phase, a number of publications, a significant number of publications <coughs> has been published. Uh, in terms of the, of the applied the research, uh, results of the research, uh, this represents a, a very nice potential for a spin-offs that um, uh, we are now investigating uh, and we are trying to develop uh, techniques how to assess um, uh, the, the usefulness of, um, of, of these uh, results. Um, um, we have built uh, quite robust teams within the free facilities um, that uh, uh, again, um, sh and one third of them already now are international. That means uh, the aspect of, of mobility of the resources is present there and can be taken into account uh, while building uh, the next steps during the operation phase. Also, the international cooperation is a significant uh, aspect that has been mentioned already before as well. Um, uh, what I would like to stress here is uh, even though I'm talking just about the construction phase of the research infrastructure, uh, the only, the only uh, tool we, we or the, the uh, <coughs> most important tool we had was uh, the, uh, using funds in an uh, adequate way not only to procure technology but also to build partnerships to, to boost uh, and help industry uh, to, to bring really new products uh, that uh, will be represent the state of the art of the, of the technology. And uh, I will uh, finish with one last slide. This is the example of uh, uh, not only measuring a particular indicators, but um, how to establish the research infrastructure in a way that uh, the innovations are not just a byproduct, but uh, uh, by building the right ecosystem, um, uh, we can really observe effects that um, I believe are, are the 
the, the, the important ones. So this shows the area where Eli Beam Mines is um, hosted uh, on the south outskirts of Prague, uh, which is uh, well connected to the highway, to the Prague subway, to the airport, and, uh, and three municipalities that has decided to, um, let's say, define uh, it themselves as a region for, for science and, and innovations, uh, taking the advantage of hosting uh, uh, free uh, uh, research centers and, and a large research infrastructure as, as Eli, and uh, only in last uh, um, uh, f uh, five, six years, uh, they succeeded to, to attract uh, not only the support of the government and the, and the Central Bohemian region, but also many SMEs that, uh, that started to move to the region uh, not directly linked to what we are doing in terms of ELI, uh, in, in for instance, but because they feel that uh, the, the human capital, the infrastructure is there and uh, uh, that it, they can benefit from uh, being present there because it's, they are not coming there because they will be subsidized, they are coming there to, to invest their own money. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roman. So, uh, very good to hear from uh, a good example of a combination of structural funds and the real European infrastructure. And um, now we will pass on directly to Bob Jones, uh, senior member of uh, scientific staff at CERN and uh, uh, the leader of uh, the Elix Nebula Initiative. Uh, Bob is also the coordinator of the AGN, AGN Cycloud Horizon 2020 pre-commercial procurement project, which is uh, procuring innovative cloud services to establish a cloud platform for the European research community. So, thank you for being with us, Bob, and uh, looking forward to hear your presentation. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, as was pointed out earlier today already, Octavi referred to the PCP instrument, pre-commercial procurement instrument, and uh, he said it was a heavy instrument, and I can confirm that. However, we have a number of lessons that we have learnt. We've still got the scars, and I want to show you some of those so that you could potentially make use of this instrument as well. Um, what called us CERN and the other partners in this project to use or consider using this instrument? Well, first of all, let's remember the, the background. CERN, you've heard about it for the LHC. Um, we have an important research infrastructure um, which produces massive amount of data. I'm not going to go into the IT details. That's not the point here today, right? Massive amount of data. That machine is not stationary. That's to say in the sense that there's an upgrading um, program for it. And each time it's upgraded, guess what? It produces even more data. So it means that we need to keep up with the pace at which it's producing data in order to do the processing, the analysis, and so on. Okay? But the rate at which it is increasing its data needs is faster than we can install computing equipment at CERN and in the par many partner organizations around the world. Traditionally, we've been using in-house computer centers, and we've got a network of publicly owned data centers around the world, operated by member states and research performing organizations around the world. Okay? But the rate, as I said, is going up faster even than they can install it. And since we started building the LHC, we now have a commercial cloud market which has come into existence. You've heard about Amazon, Google, cloud and so on, uh, Microsoft and so on. They didn't exist when these computing models were put in place. Now they do. Should we not be able to make use of those commercial cloud service pro uh, providers in putting together and helping support our scientific program? And that's the idea behind this pre-commercial uh, procurement, in which 10 of Europe's leading research organizations from around the world, not just working on the LHC, they're actually supporting seven different uh, research infrastructures on the SV roadmap, have come together and collectively pooled their procurement funds in order to make a single tender to procure some innovative IT services which will help them support their 
scientific programs. So what they put on the table is they put together their own money, they put together their own uh, manpower in terms of testing and evaluating the, um, the resulting services that will be developed by the contractors. And of course they've got their own applications and data which were deployed on this infrastructure. And of course they've got their Inno databases. And so it's been supported um, by the European Commission, in this case from uh, DG Connect, um, in parallel with the uh, Quaco, which has been supported by DGRTD. Um, and we're exchanging a lot of information between Helix Nebula and Quaco about how to use this PCP instrument. The underlying model behind this is what we call the hybrid cloud model. And this has been developed over a number of years from experience we've used between these different labs together um, uh, working on this subject. But basically, the idea is we're bringing together the research organizations, the, the data providers. It's not always at the research infrastructure itself where the data is, pro uh, is provided from. Um, publicly funded e-infrastructures, think of Gion and things like that as well, and also the commercial cloud services. And so traditionally, what we've had is just big science, uh, like uh, the LHC, EMBL and their work and so on, working with their own in-house services and some publicly funded infrastructure. But the hybrid model means that we're also introducing commercial cloud services there, and we're also making it available to other users which are not typically in the scope or the mandate of those research infrastructures, and also for exploitation by public, private sector users in other different uh, market sectors. And this is the hybrid cloud model. So there's a mixture of publicly owned infrastructure and private infrastructure in there together. And we're accessing it, very important, we're accessing it over a mixture of publicly funded networks and commercial networks as well. It's an instrument in which you have a number of set phases one must go through. The first one is the solution exploration. So in the case of the Helix Nebula, we started this back in January 2016. And the first time is you have to come out and understand what is the innovation potential and what are the risks involved in coming up with these new, um, these new services. Um, and here, so we did, a, 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 as a traditional tendering, we did a sort of market exploration market survey. And it was mentioned already by the other speakers about the problem that, well, when you're dealing with industry in this sort of situation, they don't want to share that information with other industrial partners because in the end of it is the contract and they'd like to get that contract. If they share that information, they may lose some competitive advantage. And then one of the techniques that we used was something called planning poker. In the room we had in a live event, and you can actually see it on, 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 the, on the web because it's all recorded, there's a live event, we had 40 companies in the room, and we used this technique called planning poker, which is very useful in the sense that it allowed us to tease out each of, from each of those companies their estimation of the innovation potential and the risk associated with any of the ideas we were proposing to them for some co-innovation. And we were able to collect that information back and use that to set up the tender document, which ensured that we made sure we got enough industrial participation in response in submitting bids into that. So I would suggest you, you consider this planning poker technique. We didn't invent it. We used a small Belgium company as an SME, as a consultant, who operated that event for us, and it gave us some good results. So, of course, we published the tender, one common tender across all these organizations with different use cases represented in it, but one common set of technical challenges, if you want. Uh, and then we, uh, we went through from that into the solution design. So we selected some companies, paid them some money, they did the designs, and then we go into the solution prototyping phase. But these phases are well defined, and you have to go through the formal steps of, of doing it each time. And then you finish with the pilot phase, and at the end of that, there should be some commercial uptake commercial uptake itself is not strictly part of the PCP, but it is an, an, a natural continuation of it. So we're currently here at this stage here. As I said, there are 10 procurers collectively putting together their money on the table here and co-funded by the European Commission. And those 10 procurers, they are either hosting or directly supporting S3 research infrastructures, research is on the S3 roadmap, and you can see them here. So the seven that are being supported are there. So the use cases have been picked up from those research infrastructures, not just from physics, from different disciplines uh, as well. And we're also setting up what we call an adopter forum. So if there are other research infrastructures who are also interested 
in making use of these new services during the final pilot phase, then uh, we will have uh, an opportunity to include them in that pilot phase as well. Um, so how far have we got? Well, first of all, we did the course, the tendering. Um, we selected four, uh, four contracts, four consortia. The evaluation was done in a, in a, um, uh, with a collection of the 10 procurers. Uh, they're experts together to do that. We selected those in October to March. They did the designs. They all, uh, the four consortia, all delivered their designs. We then reviewed those as a group. We selected the three most promising ones of them and they have been taken through, through a call-off process, into the prototype stage, which was, uh, there you can see the photograph from it, which started uh, last month at CERN, and they're busy now, and we should get access to these prototypes for testing purposes uh, at the end of June uh, this year. There you can see the, the consortia down here. What's interesting in the total, there were some like 30 companies and public organizations, so the consortia were a mixture of public and private organizations, so companies working with universities and so on uh, that submitted these bids um, and we selected I said four of them uh, and a good good uh, inclusion of SMEs and the companies came from 13 different countries around Europe so the next stage once we finish this we'll go into the prototyping stage okay um, why is this important in the nice book that was being handed out at the start you saw as well about open open science, open innovation, open to the world. In that, on page 44, you can see a description of something called the European Open Science Cloud. And we see what we're doing here as being an important contribution towards the European Open Science Cloud. We believe this hybrid cloud model in which we have publicly funded data centers who can ensure the long-term archiving and availability of our data that's coming out of the research infrastructures is there, but coupled with these commercial services which are coming from the private sector, we, and we see the results coming out of uh, Helix Nebula as contributing to that. Why is that important? There's some policy reasons as well. First of all, we do not have a mandate nor the capacity to support all the uh, private sector users which could make use of the data coming out of these research infrastructures. We have enough budget and capacity just to support our own users, let alone anybody else, okay? But by hosting it on the commercial cloud service providers, it becomes accessible to other people for exploitation and further use, but not at our expense, okay? Those private sectors people would pay the companies directly to do the processing, developments, and so on around those. So we see that as an interesting element in which it means that through this innovation, we can do through the PCP model, we can do work with companies on the supply side and the resulting services can be help us to work with uh, the private sector on the sort of demand side as well. And so with that, I'd like to finish. Okay. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Bob. Uh, very interesting. We have um, had the privilege of... Um, combining with his uh, four presentations, uh, the perspective from the side of uh, who finances from the EIB with different types of instruments, different types of targets, uh, the, Euro the European Commission's uh, instruments and, uh, and uh, the Pro Horizon 2020 program for research infrastructure that we all know and the way it highlights innovation in its new program, uh, the structural funds used and the combination of structural funds used for uh, for, for, uh, for building a, a, a distributed research infrastructure such as Eli and another instrument such as PCP being highlighted now uh, by, uh, by Bob at the end, which all converges and creates a synergy and a, a panoply of instruments that we can all analyze. Certainly this is not all, uh, a lot of questions have, have been, uh, have, have, are in your mind and I would like to open the floor for a couple of questions, not many. I have signals from the organizers that the coffee, or the, um, the catering will not wait for us much longer. So, um, I would like to invite, first of all, the speakers to come to, um, to, to sit in the round table for five to ten minutes maximum.
Right, so the floor is open for questions after four very interesting presentations. Who wants to start? It was one of those very clarifying uh, <laughs> moments. Oh, yes, at the back, please. Thanks very much. Anton Rossi from Iatris. Um, uh, we, we're in discussion with the EIB about, about innovation financing. We had a call with them last week because the, um, the bankability issue still means there is still quite a substantial gap in the very early uh, applied research phases for biomedical research. Um, and I think it's big, and that, that gap there is going to remain um, a place where uh, I don't think any, any loan financing can go. And so th it remains then to try and fill that gap with, with public good money, the money that's there for the societal benefit, so health, health performing charities, uh, commission money, and national funders. Is there any investigation or any ongoing works where people are looking at how we can leverage member state financing or charity financing or philanthrop philanthropy fund financing to leverage that with FC financing so that we can actually get some risk down, some money to take risk down in the really early, really difficult stuff in preclinical biomedical research. And if not, would that be something we could actually start discussing? That's a very long question. <laughs> I'll try to provide a short answer. If I'm not successful, then please come to me and we can have a bilateral afterwards. I think, that, first of all, I will not uh, stop the, the discussion on FC, but also on other, on other instruments that we have, which is the Innofin program. Uh, I'm just taking away your, you know, your private conversation with the AIB and going into the big picture. Um, in fact, in the, uh, in fact, in the Innofin program, we have a facility which was one of the thematic instruments, which uh, is the in infectious diseases facility, which does not necessarily, uh, your project may not necessarily match the eligibility criteria, so, but there is that infection disease facility, and the reason why I'm bringing it is up, because in fact, that facility, uh, which is in partnership, of course, with the commission, uh, in terms of also in loss absorption, that facility, in fact, uh, speaking bluntly, in fact, it provides financing the two projects that are not bankable, okay? Um, so that may be, addresses a little bit your, your, one of your questions. Then the other very, very interesting question is about, uh, in the end, what you're talking about is blending. Uh, this is not an issue only in your sector, in your area. I would say, you know, I cannot speak for everybody, but this is my personal, professional opinion. Yes, there is much more than can be do, that can be done on that. Uh, we are already at, at the EIB, I mean, we are identifying the, the, the pot I mean, we have identified the potential. Uh, I think the commission, I cannot speak for them, but is also aware of that. There is homework to be done. Uh, some is in progress, uh, and it, there is a structural issue uh, between blending different different instruments, which is uh, the fact that they have different eligibility criteria will be provided at different point of times. It's also very ca very human capital consuming from the point of view of the project promoter that, 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 that is looking for getting finance in order to move on uh, with a business, okay, a potential business. So, so yes, there is a, there is a awareness, awareness of, uh, of that. And lastly, in fact, um, I think one of the other points of your question or somehow where you, what you, what you, you indicated there is the possibility of using funds in order to uh, uh, funds more smartly that is uh, use funds to 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 leverage on access on on return based instruments yes indeed that is the case and that's very nicely pointed out by you and maybe i refer to you to to the research and technology organization study that we have just uh, completed because in fact it it, it points out to the, that in that direction as a, as a way forward so yes indeed thank you Center. 
Marina Milkanian, Russian National Contact Point for Research Infrastructures. Um, I have two questions. One question to uh, Raman, yes, and uh, the second, uh, maybe more general question to all panelists. Uh, in uh, your presentation, in uh, the outcomes, uh, you have mentioned uh, in the point of international cooperation 17 uh, memorandums, yes. Uh, what does it mean, um, 17 memorandums? Uh, are there any research activities uh, or activities uh, connected uh, more or less with innovations? Uh, this is uh, the first question. And uh, the second, maybe more general question, international cooperation uh, we can consider as uh, an instrument, yes? Uh, and how this instrument uh, can contribute uh, to fostering of innovation potential of research infrastructures. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other question that we can take up now as well, put together? Yes, over there. And uh, then we'll finish and we'll give the floor to the speakers. Hello, this is Markus Pastek from BBMRI, Eric. I have two questions how to convince, one to the EIB, one on structural funds. One of the, we have discussed within our assembly of members both uh, funding potentials. But the question really is how to convince people in the, in the, in the loan um, um, issue how do you convince member states, delegates, that um, the ERIC could receive loans? And we, 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 are, we are facing this challenge that they would just not want to talk about loans with us. And with the structural funds, as, as much um, I, I appreciate that for big projects, this seems to be a really good uh, system of funding. Uh, it might be much more difficult for smaller projects to be funded where you have to convince the local mayor, the local voivod, the local governor to include an uh, F&E um, um, project, uh, a, a research infrastructure compartment to be included into their requests. So how, how, what, what kind of advice would you give us in those two cases, please? One last question. <laughs> uh, Chi Ming Wan from the SK organization. I'll be very much interested in the uh, special program on that the uh, innovation potentials. I want to know whether for the pilot of the testing of the program, whether there are specific areas that will be involved in this uh, pilot or there will be a, a particular of the SMEs or industries that, that meet a, a certain criteria, for instance, like match funding or in-kind contribution or any other forms uh, to do with this uh, special program. Thanks. Thank you very much. We'll pass the, the word now to the speakers. And um, we would start with Laura, please. OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, I think I'm going to be um, maybe needing the help of this sir that, I, that asked the question because I'm not sure I grasp it properly. But I think that if I'm not very wrong, the question was how uh, the challenge of convincing member states uh, about taking on loans. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Uh, I wish that the challenge was not there is the exercise of, of convincing and explaining. Not all the projects will be suited for, for return-based financing. And uh, it is true also that the financing will have to be structured in a, you know, in a tailor-made tailor -made, uh, basis. Um, uh, some of the projects that we have been working on, in fact, it has taken us, like the ESS has been taking more than two years of advisory. There's another project that we currently have in, a, say, on, on our desks that, that it has taken two, two years of advisory or one year and a half of advisory then uh, for the promoter to go back and do the homework, including areas those as you are pointing out and then coming back to us then us, okay I have success I have been successful in doing this homework now we can be somewhat instrumental in bringing the the, the case of why why this is a, the, the, an adequate solution now but this is on a project by project basis and I do recognize that that is that is a challenge we have we have helped 
uh, in some cases to, to overcome that barrier, I have to say. There was another, con there was a second content of the question, but I didn't manage to grasp what was that, so maybe you can help me. Do you, do you want to recall the second part of the question, please, because I... The small size. So yeah, the small size of the, um, of the, the it's, it's more difficult to fund the, um, Small? Uh, smaller than bigger um, projects. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so we'll pass to um, Philippe in the same order as in the program. Okay, so there were uh, two questions that I can uh, provide uh, some, uh, some answer to. The first one concerns the uh, international cooperation uh, and would could the cooperation with the international partners be an opportunity to foster the innovation potential of research infrastructures? I think uh, I would answer yes with reasons, uh, not systematically. We have also to be a little bit careful when it comes to cooperation with international partners on sensitive uh, developments. But I mean, I would take an example, a positive example, which is the one actually with Russia. Uh, we have uh, launched uh, targeted cooperation uh, with Russia on their mega science projects as part of our program. And uh, we plan to uh, launch a second phase of this cooperation, uh, broadening it beyond the mega science projects, addressing also broader communities of research infrastructures in, in Russia. And the idea would actually to bring together uh, the Russian research infrastructures and their counterparts in Europe to go to the level of developing joint uh, comp components, joint developments of components and instruments in some specific areas. And uh, this is something that we would like to, uh, to launch uh, as early as, if my memory is correct, 2019. So there will be a concrete example of cooperation uh, between European research infrastructures and Russian research infrastructures, uh, precisely on the development of uh, instruments and the, uh, components for, uh, for uh, m more precisely the, the mega science. But as I said, there, there are other components that go beyond the mega science projects. That's for Russia. Now, the pilot actions that you mentioned, uh, and you wanted to know whether or not there were already some uh, communities of infrastructures that were targeted, yes, they are. Uh, that's a proposal that we have made uh, to our uh, committee. Uh, we uh, want to highlight, uh, to focus this pilot on a small number of uh, uh, research infrastructures, namely the light sources, synchrotrons, free electron lasers, the accelerators, and also developments on uh, detectors. Uh, one question mark would be the lasers, uh, whether or not we would target them or not. I mean, that's something that uh, we will discuss with uh, our uh, program committee in the next few days. Thank you, Philip. Roman? Uh, just one remark to, to your question. Uh, why I have, uh, what I wanted to highlight with, with presenting the, the MOUs there was Basically, the, the role, or as I see the, the research infrastructure as a platform, or if you want, a hub, uh, that uh, has the role to, to, to you know, establish the networks, to take the advantage that uh, there is a, um, a critical capacity of, of resources that um, uh, are, might be available for international audience. And through that, which is one of the examples we are having, uh, enable the uh, local or regional businesses to, to enter to cooperation also with uh, counterparts that they would otherwise uh, have no chance to, uh, you know, address. Uh, uh, because they have either through a procurement or through other kinds of cooperation uh, has already established um, a successful cooperation with us. This is one of the channels they can, uh, they can, they can enter to the game. And um, um, all of them are pretty much with producing high-tech uh, components, uh, technology, or, or other aspects. Uh, I mean, the, the other part of the question has been already uh, responded in terms of like the, the broader context of international cooperation and, and innovation potential. In terms of the other question related to the structure funds and how to convince the local um, authorities, 
uh, I mean, <clears throat> uh, I, uh, taking the experience from Czech Republic, I did not observe uh, uh, harder or easier times for being big or smaller in terms of uh, uh, proposing uh, um, 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 research, uh, new establishment of a research center or, or let's say research infrastructure in this context. Uh, it was definitely more on the level of fulfilling the primary criteria of, of being a research infrastructure. That means really to have some a unique uh, capital, uh, something unique to, to show, uh, have clearly defined the uh, user community. And, and in that sense of um, the structure funds really uh, in that wording uh, bankable uh, um, implementation plan that uh, it's a sustainable uh, idea. It's, it's not just an um, um, idea that would be limited to a, a particular audience. Thank you very much, Roman. Um, and uh, Bob, any final comments? Um, the only point I would say is that I didn't mention was that uh, we've done a bit of a study of how ERIC structures could potentially make use of the PCP instrument. Um, at the moment, it seems there has been some interest in the life science domain of using it not just for IT purposes, but also for sort of uh, procuring some of the, um, some of the instrumentation uh, as well. Um, as long as it fits in with the the structure of the ERIC itself. Because at the moment, if you look at most of the ERICs, most of the services they're getting are essentially in-kind contributions from the member states. Uh, and there hasn't been much discussion because they're, they're relatively young structures so far about what is their procurement role. Uh, it's foreseen in the, in the underlying legislation, but I don't think it's been exploited much uh, yet. And I think that needs further study. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, we have to come back here at uh, a quarter past two. So, uh, lunch is outside. Uh, catering is waiting for us. Thank you very much and thank you for the excellent uh, for speakers. Uh, now we are going to the exciting part of uh, innovation in action. We have heard so far the innovation in policies, in objectives, and now we are going to some uh, specific examples about the innovation through the spin-off companies, which is actually a very common tool to translate the research results into innovative uh, products, uh, innovative services. And uh, we are going also to, to investigate some opportunities uh, with, uh, for collaboration with existing clusters or creating new clusters. And uh, we have excellent speakers from diverse disciplines, so we will have the chance to see how these uh, kind of instruments, uh, how these uh, innovative actions uh, differ from field to field. And the first speaker is Professor Klaus Goran Wallstorm. He's the head of the Atomic Physics Division and uh, of the Land Laser Center at the Land University in Sweden. And he's also coordinating the Laser Lab Europe, an infrastructure that brings together 33 leading laboratories for laser-based interdisciplinary research in 16 countries, among which my own country in Greece. So. Thank you. Okay, so I will uh, talk about lasers and as such, as part of photonics. And photonics is, I should just, some of you are not in the laser business, some of you are not in the photonics business. Photonics is the science of light. Using light, detecting light, but also controlling light, manipulating with light in a range of different uh, applications. Lasers and photonics is a big area. It's a global market of about 400 billion euros annually, and Europe has a big fraction of that. There are about 300,000 employees in Europe, 2015, in the field of photonics. And uh, over the period between 2011 and 2015, 19,000 new jobs were created within the photonics area in Europe. So this is indeed saying that lasers and photonics is key enabling technology. And this is what I'm going to talk about now, spin-offs in this area. But lasers, what, they are the light source, one of the, one of the light sources for the photonics area. 
And what's so special about lasers is that they produce coherent light. Coherent means that the photons, the waves, are oscillating in phase. And why does that, is that so important? When we say that they oscillate in phase, we say they are coherent. And by doing so, we get unprecedented power. Lasers can produce powers that no other light source can do, which opens the possibility to do welding, cutting, industrial machining with lasers. One can have spectral purity, extremely narrow band, one single color, and tune it extremely accurate. And we can modulate light. No other light source can be turned on and off as quickly as a laser. And that is the basis for the whole internet, for all our telecommunication. It's built on optical fibers and fast modulated lasers. It's a fantastic precision because they are coherent. And this gives the possibility to ultra-sensitive, like sensing in medicine, in biology, we can do remote sensing, we can do control, and a large range of technologies. So, indeed, lasers and photonics is sort of an enabling technology for many, many spin-off companies, many new areas of mob market. <clears throat> and here comes Laser Lab Europe. Laser Lab Europe does not encompass all laser activities. The majority of laser activities are single PI laboratories in universities or so. Laser Lab Europe encompass the large laser research infrastructures, natural, natural laser research infrastructures. And as we heard, 33 in 16 countries at the moment. And as an integrating activity, we provide transnational access, joint research activities, and networking, a broad range of networking activities. And I put this, you see this map here, so I come from Lund, Sweden, and we're now down here in Portugal. But there are many labs all over Europe, from east to west, north and south. This, I symbolize one of the important missions that we do, and which I personally am very much fond of, is that we are building bridges in Europe between different labs, between groups of scientists in different countries, working together, solving scientific problems together, and creating bonds, creating bridges between people, nationalities, and so forth. We are not just making bridges between these laser labs, we are also part of a big project, European funded project called UCOL, where Laser Lab Europe is only one partner, European XFIL is another one, the ELI project is a third, and so forth, and ESRF upgrade is another partner. So we also build bridges between the laser the optical laser community and other photon science communities. Now, this is what's to set the stage for um, what we, who we are and the area we work in. So, what can we do? Just briefly give some examples on activities we do to promote spin-off, promote innovation and activities leading to spin-offs. Of course, we do access. This is an important part, of course, it is an important part in um, building the community, allowing ex uh, excellent experiments to be done, using the best lasers in Europe for the most advanced experiments. And we are pursuing joint research activity, continuously developing uh, to collectively, together, in quality and quantity, the laser research infrastructures. And by doing so, we are always on the move to improve, to improve, to upgrade, to develop new technology, which gives a fantastic climate for innovation. It's always there, pushing the limit, pushing the limit. <clears throat> we promote excellent science. And this is a key message. By pushing excellent science, which of course is one of our main motivation, we automatically foster and stimulate innovations. Because where there is excellent science being done, in an area like lasers and photonics, innovation comes. Behind the fundamental science comes applied science and comes innovations. We are reaching out to new users, constantly reaching out to new users and giving them training and help to learn how to use large national research infrastructures in the field. This means that even people 
not expert on using lasers can benefit from this sort of laser community or this uh, laser network. And it also means that ideas, creative ideas are everywhere. State-of-the-art lasers might not be everywhere, but creative minds are everywhere. And this can bring them together. And coming into this environment where excellent science is being done, where the advanced research is being done, with their ideas, new pop-ups come, which they bring home to their countries. We organize workshops. We have, in Horizon 2020, established an industrial advisory committee. This is not a committee for us to advise the industry or for the industry to advise us. No, it's an, a committee where we raise the awareness in both directions. We give each other advice. We tell our industrial representatives what Laser Lab can do for them. They tell what do they need from us, what can they do for us. And they're not just giving advice, they're also contributing, for example, in our training activities, which means they get involved meeting our users uh, in the early stage. So we are, okay, so we are pushing, making, uh, involving industry in our workshops and so forth, in our training. Um, just as an example, we have, this week, we will organize a workshop in Berlin on together, organized with this industrial advisory committee, together with industry, half of the speakers from industry, half from, from Laser Lab, talking about metrology and standards. We will have a joint JRA meeting by the end of this week, where about 100 scientists from all these countries come together to discuss these joint research activities. And at that moment, we put a special session on spin-offs, where we have invited young, recent startup companies in Germany, France, Italy, to come and give talks. How did they take the step? How did they manage? What did they do? What lessons did they learn? To inspire these 100 scientists sitting there and pick up ideas on how to move on. So this is part of our networking activities and so forth. <clears throat> of course, there's a lot of spin-offs, a lot of uh, innovation coming up. Some of our spin-offs are by the research infrastructure operators. We make innovations related to our improvement of our laser facilities, of our laser equipment, our diagnostics and so forth. But it's also, of course, to a large extent by users. They make ideas, they test ideas, and then they create the spin-off in their home country and independently, usually, of the research infrastructure. So it's about lasers. It's for laser science, but it's also with lasers. And just to give a few examples of some recent, I mean, just, it's just a few, but for example, Sphere Ultrafast Photonics. I think this is a fun example. It's, an ex it's a new young company started here in Portugal, but based on innovations made at the Learn Laser Center in Sweden, and thanks to the Transnational Access Program. But to make the company, to actually make this into a company, the step was taken thanks to the ERC proof of concept problem. So this was like different programs, different mechanisms contributing together. And now we have Sphere Ultrafast Photonics as a joint company. Um, Source Lab is a spin-off from LOA, one of the partners in Laser Lab Europe, located in France, developing technology for laser experiments. Light for Tech, spin-off from a, one of our partners in Italy, the Lens Laboratory in Florence, which actually supports and helps young companies or scientists in biophotonics and medicine to take the step and turn their ideas into companies. Cobalt, that comes from the Central Laser Facility, one of our big partners in Laser Lab Europe in the UK, where they did fundamental science on Raman spectroscopy, looking at shining light to liquids, looking at the scattered light, looking at the spectrum of the scattered light, learning how to analyze the chemical composition, and realizing this can be turned into a device to monitor what's inside a closed bottle. Now, cobalt is growing like this. Very, very fast-growing company, because this is turning into a product which will be located at every airport 
This is the security when bringing liquids on board a plane. This is just examples of recent spin-offs from Laser Lab Europe in the area of lasers and photonics. So in summary, lasers and photonics are key enabling technology and very good for spin-offs. Large-scale laser facilities like those in Laser Lab Europe, we push technology and methods and so forth for excellent science. But when we do that, we automatically stimulate the environment also for innovation and spin-off. So these are not contradictory. They go hand in hand. And in Laser Lab Europe, we provide training and support for new users, continuously growing this European user basis. The number of people that get experience, get training, learn how to do advanced experiments, use, explore their novel ideas at the best laser facilities in Europe. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that it's really inspiring. And it's also inspiring to see how the work of a researcher, of a scientist, is changing. So many scientists are becoming entrepreneurs as well, which is a, a very difficult task, among others. And I take the opportunity, it's just through the national contact points, that we could spread a little bit of these success stories, let's say, of this kind of spin-offs, so that other colleagues of yours could see the example and maybe inspire from their turn their own uh, scientists on how they could develop such a, such a company. Thank you. So we move to the next speaker. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Werner Kutsch. Uh, Dr. Kutsch is a plant ecologist and he has worked in soil and ecosystem science. He has worked in Europe and Africa. He has been involved in constructing the Integrated Carb Observation System Research Infrastructure since 2009 as coordinator of the ICOS Germany. And since 2015, he's the director general of ICOS ERIC and coordinator of the cluster project Envry Plus. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't innovation a little bit like love? You cannot force it. You cannot buy it. And even if you make the coziest environment, if you even put colorful feathers like male birds do to support innovation, it might turn up in a totally different place. And innovation takes time, and sometimes the road of innovation is not straight, but winding. I give you an example for this. Um, what do you think is the most uh, innovative car building company nowadays? It's not VW, they are very innovative in writing software, but uh, I think it's Tesla. It's Tesla because they are building electrical cars. They are very innovative for the future. But why? why do you have the idea to build electrical cars? Because you want to reduce emissions, you want to reduce air pollution. And on the left side, you see Charles David Keeling. He invented in the 50s the measurement of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And he, the Keeling curve, is the most cited data set ever in science. So who was the the bigger innovator. The, the uh, example of Keeling and Tesla, Elon Musk, is in a way an example for environmental research infrastructures and innovation related to in environmental research infrastructures. This is um, a scheme about environmental literacy uh, and we are working with this in the, in the Envy Plus, the cluster project of the environmental infrastructure. In principle, it's saying there is, on the left side, the human sphere, on the right side, the environmental sphere, and every action from the human sphere has impact on the environmental sphere. Just to get a better explanation here in this presentation, I have simplified it. So you have a human action, and the human action has an impact on the state of the environment. And this is observed, and Keeling was here. He was 
on the site observing the, the environmental impact and he provided environmental knowledge to the, to the and inf environmental information to the um, society and started with the formation of new goals and innovation process. And Elon Musk is here, somewhere here in this societal innovation and this, this process to refine the human goals to reduce the state of the environment. And there are different actors on the right side and on the left side. And my personal experience when I was a mid-career scientist, I was once, uh, of course I was working here, but I was once invited to, to work together with a company that was, was um, developing biogas uh, facilities. And uh, they asked me to use my knowledge, my data, to, to uh, make their, their things better. And the interesting thing was, I was thinking, should I, should I now make a company on, on consulting? And the support for this at that time was zero, no legal support, no, no financial report, uh, support. But also my, my, my supervisor, my professor said, you have to care to your age index, you have to write publications. So the mobility between these two sides, I think are one of the, is one of the biggest barriers that is, is um, that, that innovation has. So now I have to, I hope this will work. This should be a movie, it's not, it's not working, sorry. It should be a movie showing the, the, It's not so important. It's not so important. Yeah. Okay, finally it works. So what you see is some kind of a of a modern TV curve. And you see here in red, whenever the CO2 concentration is higher than the average and in blue when it's lower. So you see the big emitters of CO2, big coal-fired power plants, and uh, you can see more, uh, later also the blue color from the photosynthesis coming in. So this is what we, how we can show the Keeling curve uh, nowadays. We can see really the, the emitters, and what ICOS is doing, we are putting towers somewhere, and from the ups and downs of the CO2 and from the, from the mixing in the atmosphere, we can really look back and trace back the emitters. And you can see here an example of the up and down going, going um, greenhouse gases. So at the moment we are here, and this is the first innovation of services that we want to develop together with Copernicus services. We want to build up a data infrastructure or an integrated infrastructure on satellites, on in situ observations, on modelings and on, on an emission inventories together with a data infrastructure where we really can inform our societies to um, better respond to the requirements of the Paris Agreement. But of course you were asking for more than the services that we are doing to society. So I think we can or we have to define the, the innovation and the relation to industry in upstream and downstream parts of, of the innovation. So let me first go to the upstream. That's what we are doing in many, many research, environmental research infra infrastructures. We are trying to have common instrument developments. We have a standardization and with the, with the industry, we are defining the standards and make their, their instruments better. We have access to field um, facilities and we also have spin-offs from our own developments. Um, if you don't have the time to go to Berlin about the lasers, 
you're welcome <laughs> to come one week later to Grenoble. We have more or less the same. We have an industry uh, partnering forum that uh, will comprise 23 environmental research infrastructures and about uh, 50 companies. And uh, this is a little bit about the program. You're welcome there. But the downstream is the more tricky one. So the environmental infrastructure usually have atmosphere, ecosystem, a lithosphere and ocean parts. And we can, of course, show that we have, when it comes to fossil fuel reduction and, and decarbonization of the industry, we have a lot of, of parts like, for example, from the, from the lithosphere, the, the carbon capture and storage, but also we have bioenergy and so on and so on. And there are more, more um, 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 downstream usage of our data. For example, I, I take one because I know it a little bit better, the, the, the um, climate smart agriculture. So we, we really can use or give our data to, to uh, systems that I, uh, or to companies that are developing climate uh, smart agricultural solutions. And this will on the long term increase the food security. The basic thing is that all of these infrastructures have experience with life cycles and of course we are educating uh, scientists and, and, and young people. There are lots of barriers. Uh, I think I have to go quickly through this. <laughs> there are very often divergent interests of industry and the environment and uh, I mentioned already the, the old industries, the old car industries, uh, for example, they are not very supportive. And I have to say innovation in Europe is slower than, for example, in the, Europe, in the US. I don't know exactly where this is coming from. And I feel as a director of an infrastructure that there are complex expectations towards the infrastructures. So we have to do the science, but on top of this, we also have to improve innovation and so on and so on. And I think this is, this is sometimes a little bit unclear what is, is the expectations toward us. There are legal uncertainties, for example, tax regulations. We had recently to decline a service uh, uh, contract because otherwise in Finland we would have been, uh, we would have lost our VAT exemption. And of course, scientists like science and they are maybe not so good entrepreneurs. So I have some conclusions. Um, we should encourage, in particular, mid-term um, scientists to go back and forth between entrepreneurship and, and, and science, but this needs also a redefinition of scientific careers. So we need new careers for bridging from data to thinking into innovative solutions. And we should reflect about um, the infrastructures. Should we do Keeling's job or should we do Elon Musk's job and, and create a constructed Tesla? If yes, we need risk capital and we need a clearer legislation about tax regulations on our eyes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, the, for your presentation. I can see that there are a lot of obstacles in the love affair of innovation and sectoral mobility, I would add, because scientists love science, but they can maybe even love companies and enterprises that can take up this, this part of the work and they don't have to do everything on their own. So we move to the next presentation by Dr. Eric Harrison. So we move to a different discipline. We go to social sciences. Uh, Dr. Harrison is senior research fellow at City University of London in the UK. He has worked on the European Social Survey since 2006, and in 2014 he became deputy director, di director at the ESS Eric headquarters. Thank you. Uh, well, follow that. I don't have anything to say about love, I'm afraid, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the way that uh, something that I love very much, which is survey research, how we uh, go about trying to uh, address these issues about uh, spin-off and exploitation, and also, uh, also say a little bit about our recent efforts uh, to get involved in, in cluster projects. Uh, so firstly, what is the ESS? Just a reminder for those of you who have forgotten, it's a every two years cross-national survey of general population which we've been doing since 2001. We conduct almost 2,000 interviews uh, with the respondents face-to-face -face, uh, in 
between 24 and 30 countries, depending on the, on the round. We aim to have the data fully cleaned, deposited and archived within 12 months of fieldwork starting, which for a high quality survey like ours is actually pretty quick. Uh, access is completely non-privileged. Nobody gets a uh, sort of prior go at the data before anybody else. It's a general release and it's free uh, for all those who want to make non-commercial use of it. We'll maybe come back to that point. It implies the highest standards of rigor in sampling, translation, questionnaire design, and dissemination. So from that point of view, the ESS is innovatory. There is nothing else uh, that has been like it hitherto. That's why it was first commissioned. So I'm going to say a little bit about clusters, and then I'm going to say a little bit about spin-offs. Uh, but I think the more sort of appropriate way of describing that in the social science context is to talk about impact. So uh, this is a cluster that we are currently involved in. This is called CERIS, uh, and it's basically a uh, commission-funded uh, project uh, for four years until uh, 2019. It comprises the following partners. So I think there should be... Yes. Uh, so it's collaboration between uh, us, ourselves, the, the SHARE project, which was spoken about early this morning, SESDA, the Council of Data Archives, and three non-ESFRIs, the Gender and Generations Programme, uh, the European Values Study, which is in the field now, that's been going since 1981, and the Wage Indicator, which is an online interactive tool which collects information about uh, incomes and occupations and allows user t users to... Uh, compare their position with those, that of others. Too much animation. Okay, so this is very, uh, just broad brush, this is what we're doing in the Ceres project. Uh, it's a little bit fuzzy, I suspect, even uh, on a big screen. But essentially, the building blocks are that we're trying to pool our expertise and take advantages of uh, economies of scale and scope because all these surveys have got problems with sampling, all these surveys have issues about translation because they're all cross-national, and they all um, have um, all the, the normal issues that you have with design of questions, fielding of questions, and so on and so forth. So what we're trying to do is, in the, the, the uh, themes in the boxes, is breaking down barriers between these social science projects, stop doing things in silos, uh, trying to enhance the future of the social sciences by uh, developing tools and new innovations uh, to sort of allow us all to be more uh, effective and efficient in terms of our, our main mission. Okay, so say a little bit about the, some of the, the challenges which an activity like this uh, involves. I should say that I think the Ceres project, and I've been working on ESS now for 11 years, it's probably the most fruitful and uh, productive project of any kind that I've worked on uh, during my time at the ESS, and I think it's been a tremendous gain for all those who've been involved. But there are always uh, downsides. First of these is what I'm going to call alignment. So you have a, a four-year project where you're trying to do a period of research, maybe experiment with something new, uh, try it out with the different partners, get everyone's feedback. But the problem is that surveys work on fixed life cycles. And so you're trying to, say, produce something, uh, trial, say, a tool or a, a mode of data collection, and then you want to, to trial it in, say, multiple partner surveys, but they're all going into the field at different times. The EVS only goes into the field once every seven years. It's like trying to spot a comet. So in terms of aligning these kind of uh, innovatory and uh, blue skies projects with the, just the routine life cycle of surveys is, is tricky. Knowledge doesn't always transfer. We have to live with that, uh, either because it simply doesn't apply or because the place where you're trying to take it believes that, as it's not invented here, it's not the kind of knowledge we want. And surveys are different. So share is a panel. SHARE is a survey of the over 50s. ESS is a general population survey. Uh, GGP is a sort of a, a rolling panel over many uh, series of sweeps over long numbers of years. So projects are different and they're precious. And clustering things together can be really helpful, 
particularly if you're sort of trying to carry a huge load of things. But if you try and cluster them too close to you, you crush them. So the problem with cluster is that you need to try and allow projects to uh, exchange and transfer knowledge, but without losing their, their unique flavor. So in terms of the ESS, I would say that our approach has not been so much spin-offs, but I think the metaphor is more a huge kind of planet uh, that gradually hopes to sort of uh, attract, simply by its, its sheer mass, uh, other smaller objects and sort of suck them into its orbit, if you like, to become part of the sort of European Social Survey uh, uh, sort of planet system. That's also partly uh, by necessity, because there is quite a limited amount of centralised research done on the data and the methods within the ESS. We're not really set up or funded to do that. So much of the research, most of the exploitation, is done in a very independent, bottom-up sense by academics. So they tell us what are the interesting issues. And uh, the final, uh, sli uh, final point on this slide, it's difficult to monetize something that you're giving away for free. Not only that, but it's difficult to monetize something that you're putting very strong restrictions on other people uh, sort of making commercial use out of. And so I think to, to some extent this has limited things like exploitation for teaching uh, because of the sort of cost of uh, being able to charge for things like textbooks and um, sort of accompanying data sets. Uh, so that's something that we have to, we have to keep uh, keep looking at. So I'll say a little bit about uh, impact because that, that, to some extent that's the main sort of social science spin-off that the data you produce. We have two products, our methodology and our data, and, and both of them have potential applications. But here's the thing, and, and Vern already made this point. This is a slow process and it's an expensive process. So uh, let's say that we have some kind of methodological innovation. First, we've got a like, proof of concept, except that people will say that it's a good idea. Then there's got to be feasibility studies. Will it work in a couple of countries? Then it has to be piloted either in the full cross-national survey or, again, in a, a sort of a large subset of that. And then if it works well, it gets rolled out and it gets adapted and adopted. But that's probably something like a process over three rounds of the SS. That's six or seven years. That's a long time. And you can see that the blueprint for the European Social Survey uh, was set up in the 1990s. So in, very, in, in some extent, although we like to think that you know, this is the modern world and we're at the forefront of it, it's got a 90s sort of uh, uh, footprint on it. Impact is also expensive and it's slow. So here we're looking at maybe policymakers taking our data and effecting change in one country or more than one country. First, we have to identify a topic that's like amenable to policy change. Then we have to open up the competition to collect data in that area from academics. Then we have to do the two-year questionnaire design, collect the data, deliver it to the archive, archive it, disseminate it, but not just put it out there, but disseminate it in bite-sized, digestible form and get it to the right people. Then the right people have to produce and design possible policy interventions based on that data. Then they have to evaluate whether those interventions, interventions have had any value in terms of a policy. And by the time they get to that stage, the problem is that the agenda's moved on and people are saying, well, hang on a minute, what, what was the original policy problem? Why were we interested in this? So this is a, a challenge for something that moves as slowly as the, as the ESS. Uh, very briefly, uh, you're going to get these, these slides, so I'm not going to say, but I wanted to include these because Technopolis uh, consultants are just finished a 15-country impact case study uh, for the ESS to show our member states what they get for, the, for their money. And they've got some very nice uh, models illustrating the kind of things that I've just been saying, actually, about the lengthy, the lengthy process. Uh, not only the lengthy process, but this is the, the framework within which we, we have to operate, which affects all these things. These slides are best viewed uh, at leisure uh, um, after, the, uh, after the conference. So, just let me uh, briefly make a point about the, the impacts we do make, and then I will be quiet. So, these landmark research infrastructures that are involved in CERIS have track records of policy engagement. So, ESS data and share uh, have been used by uh, 
directorates at the, uh, the uh, Commission uh, for Policy Development. SESTA has an enormous influence across uh, its range of member countries, and it's also seen as setting the benchmark for cross-national uh, data production and use. But there's also an impact, and this is maybe uh, restricted to the social sciences, maybe it's something special about social sciences, we're very labour intensive. So the very, uh, the very activity of our, of our inputs, of our data collection, uh, has, has an effect. So I totted up a while ago the number of people who are involved in those three ESFRIs that I was talking about, ESS, SHARE and SESTA. So if you take the, the scientific teams, the national teams, the survey agencies who do the programming and the data collection, and then the interviewers themselves who go door to door with the Herculean task of trying to get people to respond to our survey, uh, we're talking about very large numbers of people indeed. So in other words, in the region of about 5,000 people per round are involved in the data collection exercise, and that's just 500 positions. If you think about labor turnover, and national coordinators moving from place to place, it's actually higher than that. Then, in, then you add in all the academics and students who are using the data, or data archived by SESTA, plus, there, and, and thinking about that, there are more than 100,000 registered users of ESS. Uh, doesn't want to, doesn't want to, doesn't want to progress. Yes, sir. Yeah, so in social sciences, people are the data, okay? And that gives us problems as well, because unlike stars and bits of coral, they care about the data you collect about them, and they're a bit twitchy about what you do with it, which uh, causes other problems for us. So you add in the people that we actually uh, sample as well, and you get to your bottom line figure, which is that at some point, half a million people in Europe have been touched in some way by these three uh, SFRIs, ESS, share and sester and that is a lot of impact thank you thank you very much i think that it is really important to to show that uh, policy makers that are usually uh, mentioned in this kind of conferences as funders of the research infrastructures. They are also users of the data for science, uh, scientific based policies. So I think that this is a really important point there. So with that, we move to the last speaker, Dr. Sergio Bertolucci, who is a professor in physics at the University of Bologna and the chair of the scientific committee of Attract Project, a project that aims to connect open science to open innovation. Thank you for uh, inviting me here and just to talk about uh, Attract. Attract is uh, possibly uh, a next project of uh, the, the Commission. Uh, we have just submitted, we are waiting for, for the result. It comes from the, the fact that uh, uh, working for many years, uh, I've been for uh, seven years the Director of Research and uh, Scientific Computing at CERN, and working together with all the other European scale facility, one of the things which is apparent is that if you are looking at this survey of the Commission, in Europe there are more than 500 research infrastructures uh, as a result of the fact that we are not the United States of Europe, so everybody has his own set. And these are an enormous repository of uh, skills, instrumentation, competencies, which is probably not used optimally. And uh, this fact that it is not used optimally uh, was bringing up in, uh, in, uh, in our effort an analysis. Why is, uh, is, is that? Europe has uh, a number of things of which should be proud of uh, in a moment in which everybody uh, shows the uh, points to the problem of Europe. One of the things is that Europe was leading uh, the establishment of the concept of open science. Uh, we were leading that in many disciplines and we have established this environment which is at the end an environment of trust in which people can collaborate and compete at the same time. And there, we have a very good example of that because 
if you uh, recall, even before uh, the, the, the uh, European Union was made, uh, science was used just to bring together Europe after World War II. And places like CERN or uh, uh, XFER or ESRF or EMBL are an example of that. CERN now in this moment, there's more than 100 nationality working in there in this environment of trust, which allows American working with Iranians, Pakistani working with Indians, and Palestinian working with Israeli, and Italians working with other Italians, which is a miracle. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, and so it's a success. Uh, why we cannot just uh, put this success over uh, to, 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 the, to the innovation? Why we have so little impact on innovation? Because uh, beside uh, all the, the, the good practice that we have seen, so the impact of research infrastructure and innovation is not that big in Europe. That's why Europe is declining in innovation. We have invented in Europe the web. We have invented many other things. And innovation coming out of that came out in different places. And in our opinion, the reason is that there is not such an environment of trust for innovation. And unless you have that, you lose the multiplicatory effect, the, the, this environment in which you can put together collaboration and competition. So, there are uh, many theoretical analyses of this, starting from very experimental things, how uh, I innovation places work, like the, the, the famous Silicon Valley or other places, or the Boston area or uh, others. And uh, a number of economists uh, have come up with uh, an idea, which is try just to move from open science to open innovation. And Harry Chesborough, uh, who uh, has been working uh, with us on this, uh, has stated this, has launched the, the, this, uh, this slogan of open innovation uh, back in uh, uh, more than uh, almost 15 years ago. And uh, essentially what we are trying to do with Attract is just to try, just to put this thing which is a beautiful essay book that you can read and is very, is very enlightening into something which is practical because the devil stays in the details and of course if it would be easy it would have been done already. All the idea is that you have just to convince that when you go into the funnel of a new product, it's convenient for you just to make a few holes in this funnel. Because from the holes, there are things which are spilling out, things that for most of the industry companies is, is in Europe is considered blasphemy. Uh, but things coming in, and this will uh, enormously increase your capability just to go to market fast, to reduce your development cost, and especially in a more and more complicated world where you don't have in-house all the competencies, bring in a lot of competencies which are, for instance, in the research infrastructure. So Attract is uh, simply a, a simple uh, a, a prototype for trying a thing like that. What we have done, we have made a consortium which uh, has uh, all the uh, big European scale uh, laboratories in uh, different sciences, uh, CERN, uh, ESRF, uh, XFEL, ESO, uh, uh, EMBL, uh, ILL, plus uh, a business school, ESADE, and the Alto uh, uh, University, uh, where essentially we took many of the years about design thinking, about how you go uh, from uh, uh, R&D to innovation. And we have asked uh, the European, uh, the, the Commission, just to mandate us, just to run a, a different scheme. For the first time, this group of people, this group of entities, will not ask money uh, to the Commission for themselves, but ask money just to uh, outsource it in somehow. And we want just to do essentially three things. Make calls in, uh, uh, on innovation, and innovation is a big word that we'll, we are restricting. We monitor. Uh, how they proceed, we wa want just to attach to it like we have done in this year in a pre-prototype we were running uh, at CERN, which, was, uh, which is called Idea Square, uh, also a training program for, uh, for, uh, uh, on innovation. 
and develop a quantitative instrument just to evaluate the impact. Innovation is a word which, by definition, is uh, only comprehensive, is too big. So we have restricted ourselves in a specific uh, thing, which we think is a key enabling technology, is the development of detectors, sensors, the electronics associated with that, the way in which you acquire this information, the way in which you pull out value out of this information. And we would like it just to be made with the same uh, paradigm which, uh, with which we do the fundamental science. It's clear that uh, sensors and uh, uh, imaging uh, sensor and the detector in general are the, the, uh, one of the key enabling technology of the Internet of the Things. So is, is an easy shot there. And also because now in our, in our uh, technologies, in everything that we uh, put in our pocket on, on us, there is the combinatorial effect of many technologies which all are essentially based on detectors. Now, in, uh, we followed this, uh, this idea and we uh, submitted a call to Europe, which was essentially pretty much, we, we had discussed with them also before that, the call is being evaluated now. And if it works, we will do this, uh, this first prototype, which is uh, the depicted here. So what we call, what we call uh, the, the prototype of a, a tract. The prototype of a tract uh, is a thing which is small enough just to, uh, to, to give us the possibility just to make mistakes and big enough uh, not just to be picking up hang, uh, low hanging fruits because we want just to evaluate uh, our mistake. Uh, how will uh, be done? If this thing works, our idea will be just to uh, ask Europe just to scale it up in the FP9 uh, to a much more sizable amount because this is a scheme for Europe, it's not a scheme uh, for a, a few research infrastructure. So the whole idea behind that is that with the money that we get, we will essentially, through the uh, scientific committee, uh, independent scientific committee, which will uh, operate in a transparent way, in such a way that could be easily criticized, we will select order of 200 uh, uh, co-innovation project, which will get a seed money, seed money of the order of 100K. Uh, and then that's it, that there will be, there should be co-innovation, should be done together by industry from, uh, from the startup all the way up and somebody connected to the research infrastructure. In this way, we realize something which is, at the same time, a balance between top-down and bottom-up. Because, as we were saying before in, in the talks, uh, not all the people working in uh, research will become scientists. Uh, more, uh, CERN, for instance, more than 50% are migrating to other fields. And is, uh, is, uh, is a pity is that by migrating to other field, they are not, for instance, migrating enough in entrepreneurship. So not, not all the researchers are, are becoming scientists after all. And uh, then, uh, essentially after one year, we would like just to call all them back and invite them to a sort of uh, selection, a final selection, in which also institutional uh, investors are, uh, are invited, uh, private investors, uh, the uh, uh, European Investment Bank, and all, all, all the, the uh, public investors, and we select uh, the, the first, the, 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 the best, in our opinion, 10, and we follow them all the way to the market. Uh, in, in this way, we uh, start creating something which essentially we absorb the risk with public money when things are still ideas and then we help them and we, we slowly bring them to, to the market with the help of the real partners that should be in. And in our analysis, uh, supported by, by, by many uh, business case studies done by specialists, not by, by scientists, uh, this scheme might become, uh, in due time, self-sustained. Then, uh, and again, you see, the, 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 it is an uh, uh, interleaving of, uh, of uh, seed funding 
and then you pick up uh, the, 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 the best flowers. In, in this way, you realize this thing that you start fast, you die fast, and you, you keep pushing the things which are... The other part, the, which I think is fundamental in this idea, is that we will essentially uh, encourage very much the people who are participating to these uh, seed phases just to leave their ideas with some uh, uh, form of, uh, of uh, uh, intellectual protection inside a sort of repository, uh, a store of ideas, uh, where all the people can use uh, not only what they have put in, but they can use what they find in there, because we think that this is uh, what makes uh, the, the combinatorial power of innovation, and in nowadays society, reinventing the wheel is n not uh, a good idea. And then, the, uh, the, when the, the thing drifts out uh, and become a, a product, people are, li uh, are, are uh, free just to protect them in the way that they want, uh, maybe uh, without forgetting the, where they got it. And this, uh, which looks very utopistic, we have uh, uh, done uh, a few studies, for instance, how uh, many products have been developed in, uh, in, uh, in the innovation area, and we have uh, concluded that it might work. We are using now, uh, we are working more how just to protect the, the intellectual property without going to, to a full patent. And there are a few ideas. One of them uh, I, I mentioned to you because uh, I find it particularly smart is just to use blockchain like we are, we are Bitcoin. Anyway, just to conclude, this is what we are uh, ready to do and we might be doing starting uh, uh, later this year, uh, depending on how this, uh, this uh, will turn out. Uh, this will have a follow-up, we hope, in the 1820 uh, program, and uh, which uh, we, we have heard from Philippe that more or less uh, the idea is there. And of course, we'll have just to collaborate and compete. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think that this kind of initiatives, together with other instruments that we have seen, like the SME instrument or the Innofin, uh, the loans and the guarantees that were presented before are in the same direction, so it would be really interesting to see the outcome. Now we'd like to invite all the speakers to come uh, in the round table and we can receive a few questions, if there are any, by potential entrepreneurs, spin-offers, or people that would like to apply to the attract. <laughs> you have your chance now. Can you help me a little bit with the microphone? Someone? I think that there was someone in front. Hi again. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's me again, Ed from the uh, ESRF in Grenoble. I was wondering, amongst all these spin-offs and your staff and the uh, integrated research infrastructures that you have, are, are there any sort of common ingredients that you have for incentivizing staff to give up their uh, academic careers, to take a risk and move out of, um, let's say they're 30 to 40 years old, they've got a family, what are the incentives that you might provide in order that they take a risk and, and jump out into the entrepreneurship fire? There is a negative incentive. In many, in many countries, there are no permanent positions for scientists. Um, and, and otherwise, yeah, I, I, I said it from my own, from my own uh, perspective. It is... Uh, um, there are more barriers than incentives. So, so um, taking up the risk um, and leaving the m maybe um, um, safe scientific career or academic career is uh, not what many people um, like to take. So, and uh, I think it's also difficult if you, after some years, 
feel it, this is not my, my field, or if you fail, then it's very difficult to get back into the academics because then you have missed five years of publications. And um, so we definitely have to work on, on this career path and the mobility between entrepreneurship and academics. To complement? No, I, I cannot say on behalf of Lisa Lab Europe any general statements, but uh, from the Swedish side, I can say indeed, this is a problem. I think that many young scientists, they, even if they have an idea, they struggle with this matter. Should I continue? Do I take a risk if I step to the side? So I think this is very important to foster some um, sort of local environment, a cluster environment and with companies, spin-off environment, that can help. That doesn't mean that they, they shouldn't say, should I give up my idea or should I give up my career? They can keep their idea and with help from supporting environment, the idea can be promoted. And uh, I was mentioning this company in Florence, for example, just as an example, uh, which started as a company just to help academics to realize their idea without leaving the academia. And I think this can sometimes be the key. And of course, here comes, the, in this struggle, this issue about patents. 